Tonight, the King Five investigators exposed decades of deception at Hanford. In her continuing investigation, the human toll of Hanford's dirty secrets. Susanna Frame reports that the U.S. Department of Energy and its contractors have altered documents. They hid information and buried science, keeping workers in the dark about the dangers of chemical vapors and other hazards at the site. You're looking at remote control camera video of the deadliest substance on Earth, nuclear waste, including nearly 2,000 toxic chemicals. It's held inside underground tanks at Hanford. And as this waste decays, chemical vapors escape into the open air, where employees going about their work can suddenly get exposed to them. I basically uh, was overcome by the um, chemicals, and I remember being uh, dragged out of the area from another co-worker. Don Slaws worked as a radiation specialist and safety rep at Hanford for 24 years. During that time, he's taken two major chemical vapor hits in the field, the first in 1996. And when you say overcome, what do you mean? I was on the ground. After both exposures, on-site medical providers, paid by the U.S. Department of Energy, assured Don Slaw he'd shaken them off successfully. They determined I had some spots on my lungs from uh, this inhalation, told me at the time I'd be fine. Take a couple aspirins, I'd be good. There's no issues. Perfectly healthy. But that wasn't true. Don Slaw is extremely sick with an incurable lung disease. I can't go anywhere without an oxygen machine. He's lost nearly half of his lung capacity. At night, needs four liters of oxygen a minute. He takes loads of medication, and a nurse visits him at home every week. And listen to this. The same on-site medical providers who told him he was fine knew he had the disease for 10 years, but they hid it from Don Slaw. A doctor at Harborview figured that out by studying his medical files. The evidence is right here in black and white. For about a decade, people at Hanford knew you had this damage and didn't tell you? Uh, yes. Verna Slaw is Don's wife. It's really hard for me to think about what they've done to him. Because I'm the one that sits here and watch him suffer when he gets sick. It's an emotional drain. It's a physical drain. It's hard, it's hard on everyone in our family. Deceptive practices like that date back to the early days of plutonium production. We've obtained a 1948 memo where a government official urges managers to keep workers in the dark on a study on radiation effects, writing there could be a shattering effect on the morale if workers know there was substantial reasons to question their safety. If the study got out, employees could demand extra hazardous pay and might increase the number of claims against the government. Another memo written the year before advocates that managers alter documents about health risks. The official writes that information which could encourage claims against the government should be reworded or deleted. We found a pattern of deceit that continued at Hanford for years, including this study conducted by the Department of Energy's own scientists in 1997. It shows workers are at great risk of getting cancer and other diseases from chemical vapors at the site. We were totally unaware of this. It was buried. Bob Alvarez was a senior Department of Energy official when the study was conducted. It wasn't shared with him or the workers. Should it have been? Absolutely. When you have a study that basically is saying that workers are uh, maybe experiencing a phenomenally high risk of latent disease as a result of exposure to these toxic vapors, this is sort of a, 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 real, a real strong signal that you've got to you know, drop what you're doing and fix this problem. Throughout this spring, as more than three dozen workers now have gotten vapor exposures leading to medical evaluations and treatments, the contractor in charge of the tanks has issued lots of reassuring statements that tank farm worker exposure remains far below applicable occupational levels. Translation? Don't worry about it. And that's been the consistent message for decades. Is that what and you were told we were during told. that time? Yes, we were told day after day. We asked experienced tank farm worker Mike Geffrey, who recently retired after 26 years at the site, to look at data we've obtained showing some chemicals measured at Hanford not far below, but well above acceptable levels. Oh my God, I was out there at these farms on these dates. Every one of these farms I was out there. I was out there working in these farms on these dates that they took these readings. Here's what we've gotten copies of. Vapor measurements taken between 2005 and 2009. Among them, mercury measured in 2009 at 473% above occupational limits. 
Mercury can cause brain damage. Ammonia, which can cause glaucoma and lung damage, measured at more than 1,800% above the limit. And there's this, a known cancer-causing chemical called nitrosodimethylene found at more than 13,000% above legal limits in 2005. And so when those exhausters are going off and exhausting these gases, they just float around in the atmosphere where I'm standing and working and breathing and eating my lunch. I'm just thinking, who in their right mind had this information and didn't give it to us? Neither Geoffrey nor other workers we've talked to ever saw this data, data that's been available for nearly a decade. Do you feel deceived? Oh, terribly, because somebody looked at this information and made the decision, we're not going to tell them. That guy should go to jail. Okay, that guy who made that decision that we're not going to tell the employees should literally be uh, put on trial as a criminal. I don't ever remember hearing talk about the chemicals in the tank, tank farms. Ever? No. As for the slaws, they're angry. No one warned them about the dangers of chemical vapors and poisonous gases. They need to have the information in their hands of how dangerous it really is to work in these areas. Because it's not fair to send somebody out there that doesn't know. They were kept in the dark and will suffer the rest of their lives because of it. And the scarring continues to scar and scar, and you basically lose lung capacity because of the scarring. But they need to think about the workers as being human beings and think about the consequences that they're causing them. They need to think about people, not money. So late this afternoon, we got a response from the Department of Energy about those high levels of chemicals measured at the site. In a part, they wrote us that the statistics cited by King do not represent potential worker exposure levels. Rather, they represent levels found within the tanks or the exhaust stacks from the tanks, areas that are not accessible to workers. They go on to say since 2005, where workers could actually experience exposure, there have been no limits measured that have been exceeding uh, what is acceptable. Uh, we did speak with some experts that are very familiar with this sort of sampling who say they disagree. If it's in the tanks and in the stacks that come up, mm -hmm. that means workers can be exposed to, to the same chemicals. Mm -hmm. Still vulnerable. Yes. Susanna, thank you. Thanks, Susanna. And good evening, everyone, and thank you for staying up with us. And we begin tonight with a medical mystery. A serious, sometimes fatal birth defect that are much more prevalent right here than anywhere else in the country. Neural tube defects from spina bifida to anencephaly. Benton, Franklin, and Yakima counties are being hit the hardest. And this is our big story. It might be a small group. How can you really tell if but they're certainly not quiet, especially Nikki and Craig Sheldon. Our son was born in February with spina bifida, and we had no idea. No idea and no reason to think that they could become part of this statistic. When we went through it, the doctors were stunned. They didn't know that all this was going on. The doctors had no clue that there was so so many high cases in our area, so why is there no communication? That's the hope behind this meeting, to begin the conversation, because the health department doesn't know why our community has become a hotbed for neural tube defects. We've hit a wall. Our first uh, look, we didn't find something, uh, we didn't find a smoking gun, we were hoping to. Public health experts examined medical records for risk factors like source of water, obesity, location, occupation, folic acid, even vitamins, and ruled them all out. It's scary. It's scary. It's scary that although a lot of the questions were answered today, and I did feel like for the most part we were heard, um, it's scary that the cause of this is such a mystery. Candelaria is still considering having more kids, or at least she was. She says the high rate of anencephaly in our area has her second guessing. A baby being born without a brain here is eight times the national average. 23 cases in just three years. Figure out what's going on and what people are doing to get control of the situation. The health department is taking all the suggestions and comments collected over the past two days and giving them to an advisory committee. There's still a lot we can do to try to prevent these, even in the absence of finding a smoking gun. Candelaria is the prime example. You know, I'm going to go back and educate my community, you know, my friends and my family. The health department says these birth defects aren't like a virus. They don't expect the numbers to skyrocket next year. In fact, this could just be a random pocket, and that's what they're hoping for. Long awaited government report on killer whales is out. The population of southern resident killer whales, the kind we see around here the most, isn't recovering the way we had hoped. 
Como Force Jeff Burnside has more. It's the impossible wish of top orca researcher Brad Hansen. If wild orca could just tell us what's wrong, we could help. There are 80 southern resident killer whales left from a high of 100, a low of 70. This new report issued every 10 years summarizes everything we know to keep them from dying off. Yeah, as much as we've learned in the last 10 years, there are still many mysteries about the whales. Scientists want to know whether the problem is the availability of salmon. She says orca prefer Chinook salmon, Fraser River Chinook. Noah thinks the orca's salmon are being swiped by rising numbers of marine mammals or possibly too much fishing. Noah prefers to increase, though, the supply of salmon by protecting rivers and streams. The report helps focus those efforts. New vessel distance rules are now being enforced. Scientists believe vessels and their noise change orca behavior, causing them to work harder, which burns blubber, exposing them to the contaminants stored inside the blubber, like DDT and flame retardants. When an orca dies, its carcass is rarely found to examine why it died. Recovery of southern resident killer whales is so complicated because they have a, a range that goes from California to southeast Alaska, including Canadian waters. And that's a much larger area they will will now have to search for more clues. Like most research, answering one question only leads to more questions. For example, experts want to know, maybe it's not just the salmon issue alone, or the pollution issue, or the human interaction problems. Maybe it's all three working in tandem to harm the orca. One thing is certain, though NOAA has had this budget cut recently, a lot, but it will take time and money to save one of the Northwest's most iconic species. On Puget Sound, Jeff Burnside, Como Forney. Federal officials investigating a radiation leak at a New Mexico nuclear waste facility are now focusing on Los Alamos National Lab. A barrel of toxic waste that Lannel shipped to the waste isolation pilot plant near Carlsbad caused that February leak. Well, a state official says that there are nine different probes underway at Lanel. The incident at WIP contaminated 22 workers and forced the plant to close. Just in time for 4th of July festivities, the folks who plan to celebrate at the Bridgeton Municipal Athletic Complex get what some are calling great news. A preliminary report on radiation screening was released today, and Contact News' Benita Cornut has been following the story. He's live with the latest. Benita? Well, that's right, Tom. In May, the Environmental Protection Agency, Region 7, conducted surface screening at the recreational facility. Preliminary results suggest BMAC is safe, according to an EPA spokesperson. Now, EPA workers collected data from 58,000 surface points. They were looking for gamma level radiation that could potentially pose health risks. After analysis, the agency says they have strong indication there's no radiation threat above or below ground. Over 100 soil samples collected at the same time are still under review. This all started when a citizens group did their own testing and found a spike in contamination. They say they are anxious to see soil results. We asked both the EPA and a community activist if the equipment used was sensitive, was sensitive enough for surface screening. Absolutely it is, and, and in fact it is checked repeatedly through the process. It is calibrated. We use samples of known uh, radionuclides to test its sensitivity and so yes we're we're confident of the results that have come back through this portion of the screening we really want to see those soil samples we were just told at a CAG meeting that gamma is not a way to indicate that something is or isn't safe and that you have to have soil samples now again those results of the soil testing will be available in late July. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission says it is keeping a close eye on the Palisades nuclear plant. An inspection revealed problems in the work environment. The NRC held an open house today to talk about the plant's performance. WSBT's Rachel Lake was there and has more tonight. Rachel. Jennifer, the NRC completed that inspection in February of this year. It revealed some security staff at Palisades did not feel, quote, free to raise safety concerns. According to a letter from the NRC to the plant's vice president, the employees interviewed expressed reservations about raising issues or concerns for fear of retaliation, and they didn't feel there was enough confidentiality when it came to voicing those concerns. At tonight's public meeting, leaders of Entergy, the company that owns Palisades, admitted there was an erosion of communication in the security department, but Entergy's director of regulatory and performance improvement says they're trying to fix that through 
Leadership Development Initiatives and a new Safety Review Committee. He says they also brought in an independent consultant to help them understand where things went wrong. But an NRC representative says he doesn't understand why it took his group's involvement for the issue to be brought to light. The fact that in this case these were issues identified by our inspectors as a part of a special program the licensee was already conducting to address this type of issue is not what we'd expect. It's less than the performance that we'd expect from the licensee. Fundamentally, we have a communications issue that has not been corrected. Uh, communications uh, is a three-way process. You obviously have a sender, you have a receiver, but the sender needs to validate that the receivers understood the message. We have failed uh, with respect to that, and we vow to improve that. The NRC representative says his group will continue to inspect Palisades activities and that it will do a special inspection later in the year to see whether work conditions have in fact improved at the plant. On another note, the NRC says Palisades has improved when it comes to actually operating safely. In the studio, Rachel Lake, WSBT Channel 22. ...nuclear reactors operating in 31 states across the country. After the disaster at the Fukushima nuclear power plant in Japan in March of 2011, the U.S. nuclear your energy industry started asking, what if that happened to us? Their answer, two regional response centers to help in case of an emergency, and one of them is located here in Memphis. Local 24 meteorologist Sean Parker was there today. When they opened the place, they cut the ribbon, and Sean is local in Memphis tonight. The size of all this equipment just makes you feel so small, from the cords to the generators to the pumps. There's only one other facility like this in the country, and that's in Phoenix. It's all part of a $400 million investment from the nuclear industry. These are large pumps, uh, high capacity, high pressure pumps. We're working with turbine generators. Generators and pumps move electricity and water. Seems too simple, doesn't it? You're looking at millions of dollars worth of equipment designed with safety in mind. A natural disaster like happened in Japan, uh, one of the most critical things that you need to do is move water. And you need to move water to keep the containment covered and the, uh, the core covered in the containment cool. If you don't have that, you really set yourself up for a real dire situation. So this equipment is, is brought in to ensure that we maintain those pumps. The power of the equipment being housed in this warehouse is incredible. From the levers, the gauges, the pumps, the air filters. But why have it all here? What makes Memphis so special? You've got the Mississippi River system. You've got the trucking industry here. You've got all the warehousing industry here. You have FedEx that's only three or four miles away from us here. So it is a natural for us to put this here in Memphis. The closest nuclear reactors to the Mid-South are in western Arkansas and the Tennessee Valley. The farthest is in Washington State. The equipment and response team has 24 hours to get to the disaster site. In a very short period of time, their trucks will be able to come in, hook up to these trailers, load the aircraft, Craft, and then fly them to staging areas that are pre-set up already at any nuclear power plant in the United States. When asked how long this emergency equipment is going to be available coming out of this facility in Memphis, they told me as long as we keep making nuclear power. In Memphis, Sean Parker, Local 24 News.